Activity 11 is going to look at a specific property of crystalline solids called unit cells. A unit cell is defined as the smallest repeating unit of a crystalline solid. And we're going to look at three specific unit cells here in Activity 11. The first one's called the simple cubic unit cell. If you actually have eight atoms or molecules or ions arranged in a perfect cube, and you repeat this pattern over and over again until a macroscopic crystal has been developed, we say this is the simplest repeating pattern in this crystal, and thus this is its unit cell. Its name is called simple cubic. The picture I've shown for you right here is inaccurate in two senses. First, the eight corner atoms you see in the picture, I have them spread far apart from each other, which is really not the case. Those eight spherical atoms would actually butt up next to each other. There would be no space between them. So I'll show you a more accurate picture in just a moment. A second thing is if you take a look at, let's say this top right corner atom, if you imagine where the three lines of the cube all meet, they would meet right in the center or at the nucleus of that atom, which means all the part of the atom that's outside of that is actually not in the unit cell. And the same is true for all of the corner atoms. There's a good fraction of each atom that's actually outside the uh, unit cell itself. So when I show you the picture, you're going to see these eight corner atoms as only showing a fraction of each inside the cube itself. So here's a more accurate description of the simple cubic unit cell. Notice the atoms are butted up to each other here. There's no space between them. And only some fraction of the entire sphere, which would be that this big here, is actually contained inside of the unit cell itself. The unit cell is the pattern that if you repeat it over and over again, it actually would make the giant crystal that you can macroscopically see. Much like if you buy tiles and they always look the same and then you put them together in a, a different arrangement, you can wind up making really pretty patterns like this. Well, this particular unit cell I have in the middle picture repeats itself over and over again. And as it does, those little fractional atoms on the corners combine together to eventually make full atoms and you wind up getting an entire crystal where the picture in the center is really and truly the simplest repeating pattern, therefore the unit cell. If you look at your data table for activity 11 and the section on simple cubic unit cells, we're going to see if we can answer some questions quantitatively about matter in which the simplest repeating pattern is this simple cube. The first thing we want to identify is the side length in terms of R. So the side length is just the distance from one corner to the next, next nearest corner along any side of this particular unit cell here. In this case, we want to do it in terms of radii. So because this is a spherical atom here, you can see the picture. What's shown is this atom has its radius right here. So this is one radius of a corner atom butting up to another atom, and that's its radius as well. So in this case, we can clearly see that the distance all the way across this side length is just one radius plus a second radius, so it'd be two radii. And if we use R to represent the radius of an atom, the side length in this simple cubic unit cell turns out to be 2R. In your data table, under side length in terms of R, you can enter 2R. So that's a physical observation you can make just by looking at the unit cell and determining how many radii are there from one corner to the next nearest corner. That's going to equal your side length. The second thing we want to try to calculate is the volume of the unit cell in terms of R. Because this is a cubic solid, we know the volume of a cube. And now if you have a rectangular solid, the volume is length times height times width. But if that rectangular solid is a perfect cube, length and height and width are all the same. We usually just call that S for side. And so the volume of this cubic structure would be side times side times side or side cubed. Because we know what the side length is in terms of R, the side length is two radii. The volume of a simple cubic unit cell always has to be two times the radius quantity cubed. And if you multiply that out, two to the third power is eight, r to the third power is r cubed, so therefore the volume of a simple cubic unit cell is always eight r cubed. You can write this work in box number one where you should calculate how you get the volume in terms of r, and then the final answer, eight r cubed, can be written in your data table. The next entry is equivalent number of atoms per unit cell. How many atoms are in a simple cubic unit cell? And if we take a look at the picture, we can see there are actually eight atoms that are taking part in the unit cell, but only some fraction of each of those are actually contained inside the cube itself. 
So we have to figure out what fraction this is. And this fraction right here happens to actually be one eighth of a sphere. Here's the whole sphere here. And only one eighth of it is located inside of the cube. Because there's eight atoms here on the eight corners, each of them only one eighth inside of the cube, the number of atoms in the unit cell can be calculated by going the eight corner atoms multiplied by one eighth each. That adds up to one. So if you take these eight one eighths and put them all together, you would actually get one complete atom. And so therefore there's one equivalent atom per unit cell. You can show this work in box number two, and then in your data table, write one atom per unit cell. The next uh, calculation we want to do is determine what's the percentage of unit cell occupied by atoms. If we take a look at the picture, anything that's in gray are the atoms that are in the unit cell, and then all this white stuff in the middle, this is just empty space or vacuum. And we want to know how much of this unit cell is actually made up of matter as opposed to how much is void here. It looks like maybe it's about 50-50, I don't know, about 50% atoms and 50% empty space. The way we do that is we first have to picture percentages as fractions. If you want to know the percentage of boys in a classroom, it's the fraction of the number of boys divided by everybody in the classroom. If you want to know the percentage of atoms taking up space in the unit cell, you need to know how much space the atoms are taken up and divide it by the space taken up by the unit cell itself. To make it a percent, we then multiply it by 100. So our calculation is going to be the volume of all of the atoms that are in that unit cell divided by the actual volume of the unit cell itself, and then we multiply by 100 to make it a percent. So how do we get the volume of atoms? To get the numerator in a calculation like this, you have to know how many atoms are in the unit cell. And as we just calculated, a simple cubic unit cell always contains one atom. So if you take that one atom and think, I wonder what the volume of one spherical atom is, well, thinking back to geometry in high school, the volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So the volume of the atoms in this unit cell would be one atom multiplied by 4 thirds pi r cubed. That's our numerator. The denominator is the volume of the unit cell itself. What's the volume of that cubic unit cell? We had calculated that earlier as 8 r cubed. So I now have my fraction. It's going to be 1 multiplied by 4 thirds pi r cubed on the top divided by 8r cubed on the bottom, and then to make it a percent, we multiply it by 100. So here's how we're going to calculate the percent of the unit cell that's occupied by atoms. And why don't you take a minute now and see if you can calculate what that would come out to. These are all exact numbers. There are no measurements here, so you can get your answer and just randomly round it to three significant figures. So take a moment, calculate what it is, just pause the video here, and then turn it back on when you're ready to see if your answer is correct. So when you do this calculation, you notice the R cubes cancel out on the top and the bottom, so it really doesn't matter how big the atoms are. The percentage of the unit cell occupied by atoms is always going to be the same. And to three significant figures, this works out to be 52.3%. So about half of that cube is occupied by atoms, and just a little less than half of that cube is dead space. So this is actually not a very efficient way to pack spheres together. We're going to see other unit cells in which a higher percentage of the unit cell itself is made up of atoms and a lesser amount of the uh, space is uh, just empty space there. But you can enter the uh, calculation you just did in box three and then on the data table where it says percentage of unit cell occupied by atoms, you can enter 50.3%. Now, with calculations like these and quantitative information from these unit cells, you can now answer some more sophisticated questions. And that's what's happening in calculations four and five. Cal calculation number four is asking you to determine the density of polonium metal. And you're going to do this based upon the fact that you know the polonium forms simple cubic unit cells and that the polonium has uh, atoms who have a radii of 0.168 nanometers. So how do you use information about a unit cell and the radii of the atoms to calculate the density of the particular metal theoretically? Well, the way we're going to do that is by going back to the definition of density. Density is always mass per volume. When you're dealing with a particular unit cell and you know the radii of the atoms, you're trying to get the density, you need to pick a specific amount of the polonium metal to calculate its density from, and that amount is going to be one unit cell. So what we're going to need to do is calculate the mass of one unit cell of polonium, 
divided by the volume of one unit cell of polonium. And whatever that comes out, that's going to be the density of that unit cell. And it's also going to be the density of the entire crystal of polonium. So how do we calculate these? Where does the mass of a unit cell come from? It comes from the atoms that are in the unit cell. So you have to know how many atoms are in a particular unit cell. For a simple cubic unit cell, there's always one atom. So the mass of this unit cell is going to be the mass of one polonium atom. So how do we convert one polonium atom into a unit of mass, such as grams? Well, it's very similar. We did something like this on the first test of the semester. You can switch atoms into moles by using Avogadro's number, and then moles into grams by using the molar mass of the particular element. So this calculation is going to look like this. Because the unit cell has one polonium atom in it, I convert that into moles by knowing that one mole of polonium is equivalent to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Atoms cancel out. Then you go to the periodic table for polonium and look for its molar mass. Now the molar mass is written in parentheses there. It says 209. The reason it's written in parentheses is because that's actually not the average mass of all the stable polonium isotopes because there aren't any. This just happens to be the uh, polonium isotope that has the longest half-life. So it's the most common one. So when a situation like that occurs, you can assume that the number in parentheses, which is actually the mass number of the polonium isotope, is going to be really, really close to its molar mass. Because protons and neutrons weigh about 1 AMU each, then a polonium-209 atom would weigh about 209 AMUs. And if it's 209 AMUs per atom, it would be 209 grams per mole of atoms. Moles cancel out. And if you multiply this out, you'll have now calculated the number of grams of one polonium atom. That's your numerator. What goes in the denominator? That's going to be the volume of the unit cell. This depends upon what unit cell you have. Just like the number of atoms in the numerator was dependent upon us knowing it was simple cubic unit cell, the volume is going to depend upon us also knowing it's a simple cubic unit cell. We had calculated that earlier. Uh, mathematically, the volume of a simple cubic unit cell is 8r cubed. Now, the radius they gave us was 0.168 nanometers. If we put that into the denominator and eventually cube it, cube it, our density will come out grams per cubic nanometer, which there's nothing wrong with that. That's certainly a density. But most densities are given as grams per cubic centimeter. And a cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter. So that would mean grams per milliliter. And in fact, the units in the data table say milliliter, grams per milliliter. So that's what they want. So it would be better for us to take this value of a 0.168 nanometers and convert it into centimeters so we can use centimeters as our uh, length unit in the denominator. So this is a metric conversion. You have to know what the metric prefixes centi and nano stand for. The base unit multiplying factor for centi is 10 to the minus second. Nano is 10 to the minus ninth. So our equality statement would be one big centimeter equals. And then you go 10 to the minus second divided by 10 to the minus ninth which is 10 to the negative 2 plus 9, or 10 to the 7th. So there's going to be one big centimeter equaling to 10 to the 7th little nanometers. That equality statement gets written as a fraction with the nanometers on the bottom, so they cancel out. And this will give you what the radii of the atoms are in centimeters. It comes out 1.68 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. So now in the denominator of our calculation, the volume of a simple cubic unit cell is 8r cubed. I now know my value for the radius in centimeters, so I'm going to cube 1.68 times 10 to the minus 8, multiply by 8, and that'll be our volume. So if you can calculate the values of the numerator and denominator and divide them, and there's lots of possible ways to make errors here on entering these numbers in your calculator, so why don't you see if you can work that out, pause the video, and then when you have your answer, come on back and we'll see if your answer matches mine. So when you do this, the units in the numerator turn out to be grams, the units in the denominator, cubic centimeters, and to three significant figures, the answer comes out 9.15 grams per cubic centimeter. A cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter, so therefore the density in grams per milliliter is also 9.15, and so this can be the value you enter into the data table, and all the work you did to calculate that should now all be written in box number four. For the final calculation for the simple cubic unit cell part of today's activity, they're telling you that gallium has a density of 5.91 grams per milliliter, and they want you to determine what the radii of the gallium atoms are if you know that it's a simple 
cubic unit cell. So to do this, we're going to use the exact same uh, ex equation we used at the top of the slide here. We have density equals mass of one unit cell over volume of one unit cell. If you're ever trying to solve for the density or you're going to use the density along with the type of unit cell that exists, you're going to need to use this relationship. So we're going to try now to plug the numbers in to our expression and then solve for the one variable we don't know. So I actually know the left side of the equation. I know the density of the uh, of the uh, gallium, it's 5.91 grams per milliliter, which is the same as 5.91 grams per cubic centimeter. If that's the density, that's going to equal mass of one unit cell divided by volume of one unit cell. So where am I going to get my mass of one unit cell? I know that if it's a simple cubic unit cell, there's one atom. So this will be very similar to the calculation we did before. This time we start with one gallium atom. We convert it into moles by using Avogadro's number and then we convert it into grams by using gallium's molar mass found on the periodic table. So to get the mass of the unit cell, this particular unit cell, a simple cubic unit cell has one atom in it. We convert the atoms into moles with Avogadro's number and convert the moles into grams by using the molar mass of gallium from the periodic table. That's our numerator. The denominator is gonna be the volume of the unit cell. And for a simple cubic unit cell, the volume is eight R cubed. In this case, I don't know what R is, so I'm going to leave that a variable, and that's what we're solving for. So it's a similar calculation, just solving for a different variable. Now your algebra skills will come into use. If we want to solve this for R, I actually want to get R into the numerator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that R cubed, which is in the denominator on the right side. I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by R cubed, so they cancel out on the right the R cube will appear in the numerator on the left side of the equation. Then the 5.91, I'm going to divide both sides of the equation by, so the 5.91s cancel out on the left side, and it then will appear in the denominator on the right side. So I isolate my R cube in that fashion, and that's going to equal 1 divided by 6.02, 2 times 10 to the 23rd times 69.72, and then I divide that by 5.91, and then by also by eight. Now, if you want to get your value for R, because you've calculated R cubed, you'll have to take the cube root of both sides of the equation. So why don't you once again see if you can go through the calculation to first get R cubed and then cube root the answer. And we'll see if your radius turns out to be the same answer that I get. So go ahead and pause it and then turn it back on when you're ready to see the answer. So when I solve this for R, I wound up getting 1.35 times 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Now, this is the radius of the gallium atoms. The data table says, though, it wants the answer in nanometers. So we have one more step to go before we can actually write a number into the data table. We're going to take our radius in centimeters and using the same metric equality we did in the last problem, one big centimeter equals 10 to the seventh little nanometers. I put the one centimeter in the bottom, the 10 to the seventh nanometers on the top, the centimeters cancel out, and that comes out 0.135 nanometers. So that's going to be the predicted radius of gallium atoms based upon the fact that it's a simple cubic unit cell and its density was measured experimentally to be 5.91 grams per cubic centimeter. Now, the second type of unit cell we're going to look at in this activity is a body centered cubic unit cell. <clears throat> A body centered cubic unit cell is a cubic unit cell just like before, but you have one additional atom stuck right in the middle. So in this unaccurate picture, uh, it looks like the atoms are not touching each other, but they actually try to get as close together as they can. And once again, each of the eight corner atoms are actually not completely contained inside the unit cell. So when I show you your more accurate picture, you're going to notice that only some fraction of each of the corner atoms are in the unit cell, although the center one is certainly completely contained within the walls of the cube itself. Now, because that atom's in the center, notice what it does to the corner atoms. The corner atoms no longer touch each other like they did in a simple cubic unit cell. There's a little space here, right? Because this central atom is pushing them all out, and so we have a little extra space located in this spot. So this is the simplest repeating pattern in what we call a body-centered cubic crystal. And so if that pattern repeats itself over and over again, you get a macroscopic crystal in which the unit cell is body centered cubic. Now, what are the things we want to calculate here for this particular unit cell? If you go to your data table under body centered cubic, uh, the first thing they ask you to get is the body diagonal length. 
So if we look at a more three-dimensional picture of our crystal, what's the body diagonal even mean? So let me locate the nuclei of all the corner atoms. They sort of outline where the cube is. A body diagonal just means a line that connects one corner to its opposite. So this orange line here is connecting two opposite corners. We call that a body diagonal. Okay, on the middle picture, and this might be a little bit easier to see, it goes from one corner, pick any corner, and then go to the opposite corner. That's going to be your body diagonal. So what is the length of that body diagonal? They're asking this of you because this is a simple one to calculate. This orange line in our middle picture is passing only through atoms. It is not passing through any empty space. It goes completely through this fractional atom here, completely through the entire atom there, and then through this fractional atom here. Now, how far is it going? This distance from here to the extremity is the same distance as here or here. That's called a radius. Then as you pass through the center of the middle atom, that's called its diameter. And then as you go from here to here in this bottom atom, that's the same as this distance or this distance, that's a radius. So this body diagonal is a radius, a diameter, and a radius. Now what's a diameter? It's just two radii. So this is one radius, two, three radii, four radii. So this distance here is actually four R. So your first entry in the data table under body centered cubic for the body diagonal length in terms of R should be four R. So on my little picture on the left, I'm gonna label that orange line four R. The next thing we want to determine is the side length in terms of R. And this is a little bit more difficult than in simple cubic unit cells that we saw before, because when you look at a side length from here to here, it's a radius and a radius and, oh, curses, there's some space there. So this distance is not 2R, it's bigger than 2R. How much bigger? You can't tell by looking at the picture. So we're going to use some geometry to try to figure it out. So the way we're going to get the length of one side of the unit cell is by looking at my picture on the top left, noticing I have that body diagonal of 4R, and recognizing that's a hypotenuse in a right triangle. Watch this. If I color in this side right here, that's one of the legs of a right triangle, and that happens to be the side length of the cube, correct? So that's what we're going to try to solve for. That's going to be S. What's the other leg of the right triangle? It's the line that goes across here. Now that's not a side and that's not a body diagonal. That's like a diagonal across the bottom face. So I'm going to call that a face diagonal. So I'm going to use FD as its abbreviation. Now what's the significance of me pointing out to you this right triangle? Because you know the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. The A and the B are the legs. The C is the hypotenuse. So from this orange right triangle I've drawn here, S squared plus FD squared must equal 4R quantity squared. Our job is to try to figure out what S is, but have it in terms of only R. And right now I've got this pesky face diagonal on my equation. So we got to try to get rid or substitute out that face diagonal. So how can we do that? Well, if you look at the face diagonal, the face diagonal is, an, is a hypotenuse in a different right triangle. Can you see where that is? The face diagonal is a hypotenuse in this triangle here where these two are the two legs, the side and the side. So what's true about all right triangles? It should be in this case S squared plus S squared equals FD squared. So FD squared, which is written right here, right, is going to be S squared plus S squared. So I'm going to substitute this out and replace it with S squared plus S squared because that has to be true. So therefore, this expression cannot be reduced down to only one other variable besides r. We can say s squared plus s squared plus s squared equals 4r quantity squared. Now, if we simplify it algebraically, the left side of the equation is 3s squared, and the right side is 16r squared. If you want to solve this for the side length, you would divide both sides by 3. And so s squared will equal 16r squared over 3. To solve for s, you'd need to take the square root of both sides of the equation. When you do that, you take the square root of the numerator and the square root of the denominator on the right side. So the square root of the numerator is 4r, and the square root of the denominator is radical 3. So therefore, our side length is 4r divided by radical 3, which is perfectly acceptable. You can enter that in your data table as the side length in terms of r. 
But if you've taken any trigonometry, you know that you never like to leave a number with a radical in the denominator. So if you want to rationalize the denominator, we multiply both the numerator and denominator by radical 3. So multiplying the numerator by radical 3, we get 4r radical 3. And multiplying the denominator by radical 3, radical 3 times radical 3 just equals 3. And we've rationalized the denominator. So this is an alternate way that you could write the length of uh, one side length of the unit cell. Either one of those would be acceptable. Now, the next entry in the data table for body-centered cubic says volume in terms of R. And so what we're going to do, oh, no, the next one actually says uh, full number of atoms per unit cell. This is one of the other things we'll have to do. You, you're going to calculate the volume in terms of R. You're also going to, let's see if we can calculate the full atoms per unit cell here. I'll let you do the volume one on your own. In this particular unit cell, we have those eight corner atoms which you may remember from our last unit cell are actually only one eighth contained inside the unit cell. But then we have that one full atom right in the very center. So that means this pr particular unit cell has eight one eighths plus one full atom, it equals two. So there are two full atoms in this particular unit cell. So in your data table, if you skip the volume in terms of R, because I'm gonna let you calculate that on your own, you can get the equivalent number of atoms per unit cell in this way. This will be the calculation that goes in box eight. And then you can enter two as the equivalent number of atoms per unit cell. The remainder of the calculations in this part of the experiment, uh, percentage uh, of the unit cell occupied by atoms, we'll let you do that on your own as well. And then the two uh, applications, calculating the density of sodium, if you know it has a body-centered cubic crystalline structure, you'll do on your own. And then calculating the radii of iron atoms, if you know it has a body-centered cubic unit cell, we'll have you calculate that on your own. We'll so, so see if we can, if you can see the similarities between how you do the problems here and how we did them on the last unit cell. Now, if you look at the body-centered cubic unit cell picture in the middle, you can see there's not a whole lot of empty space in that cube. This is a much more efficient way to pack spheres together, but it actually is not the most efficient way to pack spheres together because atoms are essentially spherical. So if we look at how we're packing them together, if you're going to make a simple cubic unit cell or a body-centered cubic unit cell, we're starting with the first layer of atoms that go like this. And then you either put a center one and then put another layer on top to make uh, body-centered cubic unit cells or just put another layer exactly on top of this, exactly how they are to make simple cubic unit cells. But this is actually a bad way to start because if you have, how many are there, 12 atoms here, a more efficient way to pack those together would be to pack them like this. Does that make sense? So if you want to pack spheres together as efficiently as possible, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to stagger them like this, not just put them uh, next to each other at 90 degree angles. Now, where's the second layer going to go? If you put them directly on top of the atom before, that's not going to be very efficient. There's a better way to do that. You can place them on these little dimples, these little divots right here. If the atoms go on those little spots there, and you can see underneath they're sitting on the dimples, they're now packed closer together. That's a more efficient way of packing. For the third layer, you would want to put those on dimples as well. And you could actually put them, let's say, right here. There's a dimple there. And so if we put the next layer right there, then you would now have been packing spheres as efficiently as possible. You might notice this red layer is exactly on top of the orange atoms that are two layers below them. So there's really only two different layers here, the first layer and the second layer, because the third layer is exactly like the first, the fourth would be exactly like the second. So this pattern has alternating layers. It's called an AB pattern. And if the spheres pack together like this, they actually create a unit cell that's not cubic. The unit cell is actually a little hexagonal prism. It's a slice that goes down through the three layers if you look from top going down. And we call this type of packing of spheres or atoms hexagonal closest packing, or HCP for short, because it makes hexagonal prism unit cells. The book goes through hexagonal prism unit cells and shows you picture. We're not going to experiment with those today, but that's what happens if you pack spheres as efficiently as possible with only two alternating layers, those two layers being an ABAB pattern. But you don't have to have an ABAB pattern to still have things packed efficiently. That red layer, if I take it off, I want you to look at this. I was putting the red layer, the third layer, right here because that's directly on top of the orange atom below it. But I could have put it over here. 
Now that's in a dimple, but it's not directly on top of an orange atom. That would make the third layer uh, different than the first two. So if you do that, you're still packing them as close together as you can, but what, instead of putting it, or you could put it here. So you're gonna wind up getting, let me say that again, because I sort of messed that up just a little bit. So if you put it here, it's directly on top of the orange atom, that would be hexagonal closest packing. But if you put it here instead, it's not directly on top of an orange atom. That third red layer is now a unique separate layer. And what you're doing now is you're causing the crystal to have three distinct different layers. It's called an ABC pattern. And now when you put the next layer on, that next layer can go exactly over the orange atoms. If you do this, you do not get a hexagonal prism unit cell. This is actually called cubic closest packing or CCP or one C short of the former Soviet Union if you're a history buff. And it makes what we call face centered cubic unit cells. And it's kind of hard to see where there's a cubic unit cell in this, but this is actually one face of the face centered cubic unit cell. And we'll take a look at a face centered cubic unit cell coming up next because that's gonna be the third type of unit cell that you're gonna be working with in activity 11. <clears throat> So a face centered cubic unit cell turns out as along with hexagonal prism unit cells as the most efficient way to pack spheres together. And so the way this works is you wind up having a cubic unit cell. So you're going to notice there are the eight corner cubes just like before, but it's called face centered cubic because on each face, there's one atom right in the center of this face. This atom's in the center of that face. This atom's in the center of the top face. This atom's in the center of the bottom face. This one is in the center of the front face. This one's in the center of the back face. There is no atom right in the very middle of the unit cell that doesn't exist. They're only on the faces. So drawing a more accurate picture of this, it's gonna actually look like this. So this is your face centered cubic unit cell. And if you repeat this pattern over and over again, you'll wind up creating a macroscopic crystal. So in the data table for face-centered cubic unit cells, they're going to ask you a number of things. They're going to first ask you the length of the face diagonal. So look at this. Where's that? That's a diagonal across the face. That's this distance down to here. Why would they ask you that? Because there's no space there. It goes directly through atoms. You should be able to calculate that really easily, but I'm not going to give you the answer to that. So that's going to be a little bit later on your own. Then you're going to have to calculate the length of one side of the unit cell. What's that going to be? That's the distance from here to here. Is that 2R? No, it isn't because there's an R, there's an R, and there's a whole bunch of space there. So I don't know what that's going to be. So you're going to have to calculate that on your own. And from that, you can calculate the volume of the unit cell. Uh, you're going to have to calculate how many full atoms there are in the unit cell. We'll see if you can do that on your own. Uh, what's the percent occupied by atoms? What you get here is going to be the most efficient way to pack spheres together. So that's going to be the highest percentage of any of the unit cells you're going to see. And then a couple of application questions they're going to give you. They're going to ask you to uh, determine the density of sodium, knowing it's a face-centered cubic unit cell. And they're going to ask you the radius of iron atoms, knowing that it forms a face-centered cubic unit cell. So all of these you're going to wind up doing on your own. So I will not be helping you with that. Now, a couple of last points concerning unit cells. These are unit cells for pure materials like a pure metal only one type of atom is in the structure, but you can have unit cells for ionic substances, which contain positive and negative ions. And I just want to show you a couple of examples of that. So we're going to look at unit cells for two ionic crystals. And I'm going to start with zinc sulfide first. When you look at a unit cell for an ionic substance, it's going to look kind of like a nightmare at first. It's all these things are all going all over the place. You're going, wow, I can even tell what's going on there. I would like you to be able to look at a unit cell like this and tell me, how many ions of zinc and sulfide are actually in that unit cell and then reduce that ratio down to its empirical formula so you can predict the empirical formula of this particular ionic compound. Now, generally speaking, when you have a, a unit cell for an ionic substance, one of the two ions will be crystallizing in some unit cell that you should recognize. And if you look at the light blue zinc ions, what's this pattern they're making? Look at this four on a face plus one in the middle. Recognize that? Look at the top. It's the same thing. Look at the bottom. What's that called? That's called face-centered cubic. The zinc ions are actually creating a face-centered cubic unit cell. What are the sulfides doing? They're fitting little holes in the face-centered cubic unit cell. 
if they're actually fitting in a hole between four different zincs, that's called a tetrahedral hole. That's what's happening here. So how many zincs are in this? Let's see if we can count them up. We have eight corner zinc ions. So eight corner ions. What is the fraction of each corner ion that's in the unit cell? It's 1 8th. So that's eight times 1 8th. That adds up to one. And then we have one zinc ion that's right in the middle of each face. Can you see that right here? Now that ion is half in this unit cell and half out. So that's a half an ion that's in there. This is a half. 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 Each of those face ions are half in the unit cell. And there's six faces on a cube, right? If you ever go to Las Vegas and you roll one of those things called a die, you'll notice the numbers on a die range from one to six because there's six faces. So those six face ions are one half in the unit cell. So if we want to calculate the total number of zinc ions in this unit cell, there's the eight times one eighth for the eight corner ones. And for the six face ions, they're each one half in the unit cell. Six times one half, what does that equal? Three. So one plus three is four. There are four zinc ions in this unit cell. Let's look at the sulfides. The sulfides have these lines drawn on them. So you can see the sulfide is located below the top of this cube. This sulfide is located above the top of the cube and it's located inside the walls of the cube left and right. That's why they're drawing those little white lines there. You can actually tell by the picture therefore that all four sulfides are contained completely inside the walls of the cube. Therefore it's four full sulfide ions. So that adds up to four. So this unit cell contains four zinc ions and four sulfide ions. How do we express formulas of ionic compounds? We always express them in empirical formulas, the simplest ratios. So ZN4S4, if we divide each by four, we get the simplest ratio of ZNS. So that would be the formula for zinc sulfide. Let's look at one final ionic crystal, sodium chloride. A unit cell of sodium chloride looks like this. And once again, it looks like a nightmare when you first see it. But if you just pause and just try to focus in on one of the two ions, you're probably going to recognize something you've seen before. Look at the chlorides here, 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 here. What's that making? Look over here. Here, 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 here. That's making a face-centered cubic array. So the chlorides are located in a face-centered cubic structure. And then what the sodiums are doing is the sodiums are fitting in the holes or spaces between them. The easiest one to see is this one in the very middle. What kind of hole is that? That's not a tetrahedral hole because it's not in the middle of four chlorides. It's in the middle of one, two, three, four, five, six. It's in the middle of six chlorides. So each of these sodiums are technically in what we call octahedral holes. So let's see if we can determine the empirical formula for this. Let's look at all the sodiums, okay? So first we have sodiums that are, let's see, where are they located? These sodiums are located along edges, okay? So they're not a corner atom. A corner atom or ion is one eighth in the unit cell. They're not a face ion. That would be one half in the unit cell. They're along an edge. This is an edge. It's on an edge, on an edge, on an edge. Look at the top. That's on an edge. That's on an edge. That's on an edge. That's on an edge. They're just a little bit harder to see up there. Here it's a little bit easier. That's on an edge, 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 edge. So there are 12 sodium ions on edges. What fraction of an edge ion do you think is actually contained in the unit cell? Well, it turns out this sodium ion is actually part of four different unit cells. So that means it's one quarter contained inside of our given unit cell. So edge ions are always one quarter inside the unit cell. So that's gonna be 12 times one quarter or three altogether. And then we finally have one sodium ion in the very center, which is located right here. And that's a full ion because it's completely contained inside the walls of the cube. So we'll add one more. And therefore there are four sodium ions in this unit cell. Let's do the chlorides. The chlorides are making a face centered cubic structure. There are 12 or not 12, there's eight corner chloride ions and each chloride ion is one eighth in the unit cell. So that'd be eight times one eighth. And then as we saw in the last example, you also have these six face chlorides, one, two, three, four, and then five, six. And what fraction of this chloride is in this unit cell? Half is in this one, half is in the neighboring one. So it's a six times one half. So that's one plus three, that adds up to four. So this unit cell contains four sodium ions, four chloride ions. If we reduce that down to the simplest ratio or its empirical formula, 
it would be NaCl.